Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome at this event sponsored by the Marty Center, where we're hosting Kristen Copes du Mess for a discussion with Brie Loscoda on um, Kristen's book, Jesus and John Wayne. Um, let me introduce the speakers uh, first. Brie Loscoda is both our guest, but also the host, because she'll, do, she'll moderate the interview. She's executive director of the Martin Marty Center for the Public Understanding of Religion, of which I, Wilhelmine Otten, am the faculty director, so we're part of a team. And for 17 years, she was at the Center for Religion and Civic Culture at the University of Southern California. Most recently, she received the Trailblazer Award from New Ground, a Muslim-Jewish partnership for change for her work supporting dialogue and engagement across communities in the US and around the globe. And just to give you a level, uh, an, an indication of the level of the award, another um, laureate was Keith Ellison, Attorney General of Minnesota. In 2017, she was elected as a member of the Young Global Leaders Class by the World Economic Forum. Brie has been executive director of the Marty Center for all of two months, but already it's been a revolution, so we're very happy that this event is, is sort of underscoring um, uh, the level of that revolution. And the main guest this afternoon, then, is Kristen um, uh, Copes du Mess who uh, is a professor at histor of history at Kelvin University, as it's now called. She did her BA at Dort College um, in Iowa, and then was an exchange student in Germany and did her PhD in history at Notre Dame. Her, area, uh, her research area focuses on the intersection of gender, religion, and politics in recent American history. And she's the author of the New York Times bestselling Jesus and John Wayne, How White Evangelicals Corrupted a Faith and Fractured a Nation. Um, for some of you might know that we hosted Kristen last year at a webinar that the Marty Center organized on religion and the 2020 elections. I think since then her book has taken off in a major way and so it'll be very interesting to hear all her um, experiences with being such a successful um, author. Um, her first book, she has more books, it was, an, was called A New Gospel for Women, Catherine Bushnell and the Challenge of Christian Feminism that came out with Oxford in 2015. And she's currently working on a third book called Live, Love, Love, a cultural study of white Christian womenhood. I think I'll leave the discussion now to, do, to, to these two women and hope it will be a very entertaining and informative one. Thank you. Thanks, Wilhelmine, and thank you all for being here for what is really uh, the first of my public events for the Martin Marty Center. So I'm so grateful that you could take the time to be here. Um, I'm assuming that most people have read this book, but there may be a few who haven't. So if you could give us an overview, just give us the, the arc and the main thrust of the argument that you're making so that we can ground this uh, in the specifics of what you've done in this really remarkable work. Sure, and thank you all for, for being here this evening. It is such a delight to be here in person. And uh, it's, it's, it's much more fun than the webinar thing. Uh, and, and thank you to the Martin Marty Center too for hosting this event. Uh, so Jesus and John Wayne is essentially a study of white evangelical masculinity and militarism over the last half century or more. Uh, now the, the problem was that I was told by my publisher that both masculinity and militarism were too long to put in a title or subtitle. And so we had to get a little creative with uh, that. Um, but the idea for this project actually came to me more than 15 years ago. If you have the paperback edition, I tell the story a little bit, uh, where it was actually students in my uh, US history course at Calvin who brought to my attention some of the literature that ends up being at the heart of this book. I had been lecturing on Teddy Roosevelt because I wanted to show my students, I was brand new prof, like first year, um, 
and I wanted to show my students how gender worked in history, particularly students coming from a conservative religious background, where to them gender is something that's God-ordained and it's a list of do's and don'ts, and uh, I wanted to show them how particularly masculinity changed over time, how it was connected to economics and uh, to race and to nationalism, to foreign policy, and um, so I, I lectured on Teddy Roosevelt. And uh, after class, a couple of guys came up to me and said, Professor Dumay, there's this book that you have to read. And that was John Eldridge's Wild at Heart. <laughs> I see a lot of head nods, and if you don't know about it, that's cool. <laughs> that's actually a good thing. Um, <laughs> And uh, so I took their advice. I had heard about this book. It was a guide to Christian manhood. It had uh, released in 2001. Uh, this class was taking place, uh, this encounter, in about 2005, 2006. Um, and the book was this massive bestseller in the evangelical world. My church was hosting uh, book clubs on it. All the guys in the dorm were reading it. And it, it would go on to sell more than 4 million copies. That's a lot of books. That's a lot of royalties. <laughs> but, um, and, and I opened the book, and there right up front was a quote from Teddy Roosevelt. And I thought, ooh, <laughs> okay. And then I started reading it, and I saw that the author was, was presenting a vision of, quote, unquote, Christian manhood that was very militant, militaristic. Uh, God is a warrior God, and every man is made in his image. Every man needs a battle to fight and a beauty to rescue. And I thought uh, it was really interesting, and as I continued to page through it, I came to see that for being a vision of Christian masculinity, there wasn't a lot of biblical exegesis in this book. Uh, a few uh, proof texts taken out of context, uh, but instead, Eldridge was looking to Hollywood heroes uh, for his model of masculinity, to mythical warriors. His favorite was Mel Gibson's uh, William Wallace from the movie Braveheart. Uh, <laughs> not joking. That was the guide to, to Christian manhood. And, um, and now, I was encountering this. I was reading this again, around 2005, 2006, I don't remember which semester it was. I could probably go back. I should go back and figure this out. But um, this was in the early years of the Iraq War. And uh, at that time, I was seeing all this survey data coming out that was showing how white evangelicals were far and away more likely to support the Iraq War, uh, to support preemptive war in general, to condone the use of torture, to embrace an aggressive foreign policy. And I just asked the same question that historians had asked of Teddy Roosevelt. What might one of these things, his vision of you know, masculinity, have to do with another uh, Spanish-American war, the Rough Riders? And, um, and so that really started this exploration. Um, I ended up, uh, for a variety of reasons, setting the project aside for more than a decade. I had my first book to finish, I had a kid, I had another kid, eventually had a third kid, and um, I was trying to write two books at a time. I thought, I, I, that's a bit much. Um, so I meant to come back to it. But I also had this nagging question, because what I was reading, what I discovered is that Eldridge was just the tip of the iceberg. Because of the success of his book, there were just dozens of copycat books uh, that were being produced, consumed in evangelical uh, spaces. And they all said pretty much the same thing, same cast of characters, Teddy Roosevelt, William Wallace, and yes, John Wayne was popping up in these too. And, um, and, and it, it seemed really extremist, what I was reading, and, and so I was, uh, and this was the height of Mark Driscoll's uh, ministry too, uh, which you may or may not be aware of, a, a really misogynistic, crass, uh, militaristic uh, evangelical pastor that was all the rage uh, back in the day. Um, and, and so I was wondering, is this, is this extreme? And is this fringe? I mean, I knew it was extreme. Is it fringe or is it mainstream? And if it's fringe, does it really warrant my time and attention? Um, and I wasn't really sure how to tease that out. Uh, so I just put it on hold, um, did some other things, got involved in another couple of research projects. And then it was in October 2016, in the days after the Access Hollywood tape release, that all of a sudden this research came back to me. Because I hadn't stopped paying attention to all these guys. Uh, who were writing, who were producing these, these works on, on rugged Christian manhood uh, in the ensuing decade. And what I saw was one after another of these guys became implicated in scandal, abuse of power, sexual abuse, 
uh, sometimes directly as perpetrators or indirectly uh, defending their um, friends who were perpetrators. And, and it was in the days after the Access Hollywood tape release when we saw the vast majority of white evangelicals, this is just weeks before the election, continue to defend uh, then candidate Trump. And I realized that the language I was hearing in support of Donald Trump in the midst of that moment, that crisis moment, was exactly the same rhetoric that I had been reading in these books on Christian manhood. We need a tough guy. Uh, I heard them say Trump is our ultimate fighting champion. He will do what needs to be done. He will protect Christianity. And men are, God fills men with testosterone to give them the strength, the aggression to do what needs to be done to protect faith, family, and nation. Boys will be boys, right? And, um, and that's when I realized I needed to go back. And you know, four weeks later with the election, uh, that's when I, I, I made that decision for good. And within a few weeks, I wrote my first essay on white evangelical masculinity and militarism, time to the inauguration. Um, and that essay kind of went viral in that moment. And what really compelled me to write the book were the comments that it garnered. You know, people say don't read the online comments. But what I noticed is just so many um, commenters who identified themselves as white evangelical men saying this is exactly right. And so that really convinced me that the book needed to be written. And that's how I ended up writing uh, Jesus and John Wayne. Right. One of the things that you detail in the book is you take the examples of these individual actors, but they really sort of illustrate a, an entire cultural production project yeah. and an infrastructure that supports and even echoes. So there's one book, but then there's multiple echoes of a similar book that ripple throughout. So how was the cultural material consumer apparatus built that upholds the evangelical project? Yeah, so this is a history of evangelical popular culture, right? And it's, it's different than many uh, studies of evangelicalism, which tend to focus on uh, theologians, pastors, institutions, kind of more traditional intellectual or religious histories, institutional histories. And this is not that, right? This is really looking at evangelical popular culture, these popular books uh, that, again, are selling millions of copies, but somehow never really made their way into the official histories of evangelicalism looking at Christian radio, looking at Christian film and, um, um, and uh, magazines. And to me, um, as somebody who has kind of had a foot in and outside of the evangelical community, I, um, I knew how important these cultural products were uh, to the faith formation of ordinary evangelicals. And I was seeing the survey data that was coming out that um, uh, the evangelicals would run their own surveys and would be horrified at how biblically illiterate and theologically illiterate average evangelicals actually were. Now, the scholarship on evangelicalism tended to define evangelicalism as, uh, according to its theology, right, a set of beliefs. So things like biblicism, the authority of the scriptures, crucicentrism, the centrality of the cross, conversionism, this born-again experience, and to me, I, um, I originally intended to do the same. That's what all mm -hmm. of us were doing. <laughs> you just pop in this definition, and then you go in and you write your, your book. Um, but I came to see that that uh, theological rubric didn't really describe what I was seeing. And, and then I saw other survey data, too, that showed um, that race mattered an awful lot because the vast majority of black Protestants in this country could check those theological boxes, but the vast majority who can check those boxes do not identify as an evangelical because it is clear to them that there is much more to being an evangelical than checking off those boxes. And, and so that's where I started to shift and, and came to see evangelicalism as a consumer culture mm -hmm. and as a system of uh, kind of networks and alliances. Uh, and it all works together. And this makes a lot of sense because evangelicals, um, even though they might identify as conservative Protestants, they've always been very entrepreneurial. 
And because if you have um, the gospel to share with the world, the evangelism, you want to do that as effectively as possible. So in the 19th century, you're producing tracts, and in the early 20th century, you know, radio is the new thing, and they are there. And um, really embracing every new technology, anything that can get the word out. And so my attention was drawn to 1942 with the formation of the National Association of Evangelicals. Important moment in kind of official, right, institutional, organizational history. And what I saw is they had a plan already then. They wanted to, uh, they felt that they had been kind of fragmented uh, in, in the wake of the Scopes trial, right? They had failed to maintain control of major denominations. And so they had all kind of gone their separate ways and um, they hadn't disappeared. They were establishing Bible colleges and churches and they were doing their own thing. But then in, in the early 40s, they said, imagine what we could do if, if we band together. And we're strength in numbers. And, and here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna establish magazines with subscribers in the tens of thousands and or hundreds of thousands. And we're gonna take to the airwaves. And we're gonna, we're gonna band together in Christian publishing. And we're gonna have bookstores across this country. It was really remarkable to read that because they did it. They did it all, like within 15 years, like beyond their wildest dreams. And so it was an intentional move on their part. And then there's interesting stories that you can get into and see how this changed the faith itself and how seeing evangelicalism as a market um, changed the substance of what was being packaged and sold. So things like um, theology actually receded in significance because uh, it, it, traditionally theology had been distributed through denominations, right? Because the Lutherans don't want to read what the Methodists are writing and vice versa. And so that splits the market. But in the post-war era, Christian living, how to be a Christian wife, how to be a Christian husband, how to raise your children, that appeals to the mass market. And so you see that the market itself starts to change the substance of the faith. And that's where we see the rise of family values, evangelicalism. There's much more to that story, um, but this is a vast market. We need to see it as such. We need to follow the money. And what's fascinating about this all is that for, for those who have moved in evangelical spaces, they are intimately familiar with these details. For people on the outside, you can live your whole life and not even know this world exists, right? And so that's what's so fascinating about this. Well, and as you write in the book, there is a, there's a sense of momentum to this, almost mm -hmm. a sense of inevitability to it. And, I think that is a result of what happened, but that, that history is much more contested. So what are the contested moments where this is not inevitable, where it, it doesn't succeed in 15 years and it, it falters along the mm -hmm. way? No, I think the book does have a feel of, I mean, there's a clear uh, teleology here, right, with the election of 2016. And so the book kind of draws you to that point and you can kind of see how, we're, we're, how we end up there. Uh, but no, a conting contingency is very important uh, for historians. And certainly, I, I try to highlight some paths not taken. Mm -hmm. And so you can see uh, you know, these little bursts of um, more progressive evangelicalism, uh, the evangelical left, uh, the um, much, uh, uh, or to, to quote historian David Swartz, the moral minority, right? Keeping in mind, this is always the minority. Uh, but anti-war evangelicals, evangelicals for McGovern, uh, you know, evangelicals who were on the front lines of racial justice, the vast majority were not, right? But you see these moments, uh, but, but these are paths not taken more than, ooh, it really could have gone either way. Mm -hmm. the, the real moment where I did feel that this narrative could have gone a dramatically different direction was in the 1990s. And that's uh, not coincidentally, I think, a after the Cold War comes to an end, because so much of this uh, a kind of evangelical worldview is rooted in the Cold War, a vision of militant masculinity, protector, defender, gender traditionalism, and so on. Uh, but in the 1990s, things feel up for grabs, uh, because the Cold War's done. What should foreign policy be? Uh, 
culture wars politics, maybe it's time for a new approach. Uh, you have a, an emphasis on global issues, uh, global persecution of Christians, for example. And this is where you see the rise of kind of anti-trafficking activism and a little bit more justice orientation. And you have a lot of evangelicals also questioning uh, tr this more rugged vision of Christian masculinity. This is, um, maybe you are familiar with the Promise Keepers movement, uh, the evangelical men's movement. This is the moment when most Americans were like, wait, what's going on? <laughs> uh, and it, for most feminists at the time, it did not look like a good thing, and understandably so, you know, men coming together saying we're going to lead our families. In the long uh, view of things, it was actually um, many men stepping away from a more patriarchal uh, leadership model and embracing servant leadership, soft patriarchy. They still talked about warriors, but we need tender warriors. And it really, when I, when I dug into the history of the movement and listened to the voices of men participating, it really did feel like for um, a few years, a handful of years, uh, oh, and, and these were the guys, too, who were really um, um, promoting racial reconciliation. Uh, as we'll see, or as we came to see, it was evident at the time to particularly African Americans, racial reconciliation had its limits. This is not racial justice, not racial equality. We need to get along. Um, but it was more than almost any other white evangelicals were doing, and it was, it was authentic. Uh, and so it seemed like this moment of, um, you know, if I would have dropped myself in uh, 1994, I think I would have thought we were, we were seeing a different direction. Um, by 1997, 1998, we see a backlash starting to form against the racial reconciliation, um, importantly within the men's movement, and uh, kind of return, pull back to culture wars, politics, and to a more rugged masculinity. And like I say in the book, um, th these, this is John Eldridge's Wild at Heart, James Dobson bringing up boys, all about testosterone, and Doug Wilson's very harsh future men, um, theology of fist fighting kind of thing. All three of these books uh, appear on the shelves of Christian bookstores in 2001 uh, and in the months before the September 11 attacks. And that's this moment that just really, you know, every man needs a battle to fight it's not just metaphorical. We have the battle right there, and, um, and, and then it swings very much in this militant direction. We're still in that moment today. Mm -hmm. As the Evangelical Project is getting organized, there's another competing vision of what Christianity is, for example, in the National Council of Churches, mm -hmm. right? You also point to, in the book, there's a moment where George Mitchell is talking with Oliver North, and that, that tension of what are competing notions of what Christianity in public looks like show up in that exchange. Can you <laughs> describe it and describe the interactions between these worlds? Do they, do they inform each other in any way? Are they uh, uh, battling each other, or does this ascendancy happen because it ignores it in some way? Yeah. Uh, so I was a little obsessed with Oliver North. Uh, <laughs> those of you who read the book know that uh, I became fascinated with Ollie, um, partly because of my own memories. I remember uh, being very confused as uh, I must have been around middle school at the time because I would kind of listen to the news, watch the news, and think he was a bad guy. And yet, in my conservative Christian circles, he was a hero. And I just couldn't sort through this, right? Traitor, hero, I don't get this. Um, I just thought he was a TV show. <laughs> I was a little bit younger, and oh. so I thought he, this was a show of a guy standing up. It was really boring. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> and, um, and then when I, when, I, when I dug into his story more, you know, he, was, he was right at the center of things. He was a convert to evangelicalism, true believer, God and country, patriot. Uh, for whom the ends would absolutely justify the means, right? And, um, and for that reason, he became a hero to conservative Americans and to conservative American evangelicals. So that he, uh, uh, I mean, after his, his trial is over and dismissed on technicalities, the next thing he does is he shows up at the Southern Baptist Convention's annual convention as this big hero, huge flag behind him. And, and he was just this representative of God and country patriotism. And we know better and God is on our side. And, and then Mitchell comes up and he's a, he's a 
Catholic, a progressive Catholic, and has his own military record, and he can hold his own, and he just, he tries to disrupt this Christian nationalism, essentially, this idea that to be a patriot is to be this kind of God and country, you know, Christian nationalist. Instead, he's like, you know, please note that the rest of us also love our country, and that we show our patriotism by you know, essentially being loyal and following the laws of our government. And, and we love our country every bit, every bit as much, and we love our God. And that just did not touch this God and country patriotism. So it was a valiant effort, very eloquent. I include it in the book for that reason. But no, it does seem like we really have um, um, parallel, not, not even parallel stories, because they're oppositional. Mm -hmm. Uh, right, so conservative uh, Christians will intentionally try to combat the influence of more progressive uh, understandings of not just gender, but um, you know, the kind of conservative resurgence in the SBC was to combat more progressive views of gender in the SBC. Um, and um, also in terms of uh, militarism, very much that was seen as, as a danger and they need to kind of shore up the support of, you know, the Christian approach to war, the Christian approach to gender. Gender figures into this prominently, but what was so surprising for me as I was reading it was the um, uh, white women who were upholding this version of masculinity. Uh, it didn't surprise me to see Phyllis Schlafly, but uh, there are others that are these figures. Yeah. What is the role of white women in upholding and constructing this view of white male masculinity that's in yeah. the evangelical world? So this, this would not exist, it would certainly not be sustained for generations if white Christian women were not supporting this model of masculinity. It's very important to note. Uh, so when sometimes, you know, critics will say, oh, you just want to blame all the, all the men. I was like, no, I blame women too, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> But uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was fun for me to go back to the 1960s and 70s and to read some of the, the works on Christian womanhood mm -hmm. uh, that paired with this. And Phyllis Schlafly is such a critical figure. She's not evangelical, conservative Catholic, right? But I kind of consider her, her an honorary evangelical because <laughs> in this story, she's just so influential in evangelical spaces. And, um, and so she really kind of uh, knits together this uh, gender and politics, the personal and the political, so effectively and, and kind of leads the way for many evangelicals, women and men. So she's critical, but you can, I, I look at other figures too, like uh, Maribel Morgan, uh, the total woman, if you know, you know. <laughs> this is a saran wrap um, story. Uh, <laughs> and um, Beverly LaHaye, Elizabeth Elliot, right? And what was really interesting when I, when I read about um, Maribel Morgan, and when I read her book, The Total Woman, uh, which also sold like 10 million copies, <laughs> like these are bestsellers. And she was writing at the same, uh, in the same moment really as, as Betty Friedan. And she also identified a similar problem for American women, for housewives, that they were miserable. Uh, and she, so they agreed on that front, but the solutions they proposed were diametrically opposed. So uh, Maribel Morgan said that the solution to women's misery is please your husband uh, and, and please him sexually, prop up his ego in the bedroom, in the workplace, tell him he's great, he'll reward you by giving you more spending money, maybe buy you a new refrigerator, um, and, and things will go better for you. Like, you know, this is your, your role in life, this is your lot in life, but you can make it better. And, and here, here are the ways that you can do that. And, you know, looking back on, on the part of me revolted by that, and then part of me, I kind of get it. For so many women in that era, they had made their choices or their choices had been made for them. Right? They didn't have a college education. And here these feminists are coming and saying, hey, the world is your oyster, you know, go, get a career. Like, that's not realistic. They're not going to. They maybe have three, four kids at home. And um, that's just not a path that is available to them. And then to feel like they're being uh, devalued or denigrated, that they ought to be doing something else when they had, they had put in a lot of hard work to raise those kids, right? And so what, what is a more viable option 
to women who do feel trapped in that space. And then you can add the layer of what does God want you to do? Right? And these, these books um, written by women like Elizabeth Elliot, Maribel Morgan, make very clear God has commanded you to do this. And many of the women who are reading this who are struggling deeply wanted to honor God's call on their lives. And this just seemed like, in some cases, the easier path, in some cases, simply the right path to take. And so going back in time, I honestly had some empathy for women who, um, uh, who embraced this role. Uh, but then you can also talk about um, kind of bigger picture, bring race into our analysis as well, mm -hmm. that white women could benefit from uh, these power structures, even as they were submissive and secondary to uh, their husbands, right? They could still um, uh, enjoy a number of privileges that came um, from being a part of this uh, mm -hmm. this culture. It's interesting. I didn't. I I think it's an important point to think about that as a coping mechanism that gets sanctified, yeah. as as a way that it could be interpreted. But then there are also privileges that come with it. Absolutely. Um, the if Schlafly is the sort of epitome of the political side mm -hmm. of this, that the, when we think about evangelicalism, we think about it often in terms of its political consequences, mm -hmm. um, less so in terms of its cultural, though mm -hmm. they're, they're interrelated. But there's a contraction of the uh, evangelical denominations demographically, yet that isn't necessarily leading to a sort of decline in their political power. There's a remarkable staying power of them even as they are smaller in number. Yeah. So how does that happen? Uh, first of all, evangelicalism has never been defined by denominational identity, right, or affiliation. Uh, and that, that's a point that I make in this book too, that uh, you know, it, it, when we look at evangelicalism in terms of this consumer culture, you can see that evangelical teachings and this evangelical formation spills out far beyond evangelical churches. And it goes deep into the mainline, right? And that a lot of mainline Christians are de facto evangelicals, um, particularly in red states, red counties, uh, right? Small towns. Uh, so it, it actually, in national borders, don't don't stop this either. And so uh, there's there's a lot of the global reach of this ideology that, uh, and it's it's through this pop popular culture, through radio, through Christian publishing, through these. Um, ministry networks and things like that. So it has an expansive reach and evangelicalism generally and certainly this evangelical popular culture is not constrained uh, by uh, denominational spaces at all. Um, and you also see this uh, affinity with uh, secular conservative culture. And this is the John Wayne part of the story, right? Where John Wayne's not an evangelical, but kind of stands as a symbol of rugged, traditional American white manhood. And, and evangelicals start to embrace that ideal. And that kind of brings together secular conservatism and uh, conservative evangelicalism in a cultural solidarity, not theological, but cultural and then political. Uh, and, and that's really the story of the last half century of American politics in, in many cases. So where does that leave us today? Um, I mean, we do see demographic decline, you know, the end of white Christian America, to quote Robbie Jones. Um, but we, um, evangelicals continue to be highly um, uh, mobilized politically, and that is not, no coincidence, right? That's because their pastors and their leaders are, um, are working hard to keep them highly motivated uh, through a variety of different tactics, um, you know, bulletin inserts, here's how you should vote, uh, stoking fear, uh, a regular pattern of that. And um, so that is, is part of what's happening. Um, but also, there's a really interesting uh, survey that just came out a few weeks ago that, uh, you know, the, the media has been tracking uh, the evangelical story, the white evangelical story with great intensity over the last five years. And they have often um, found compelling the narratives of uh, evangelical disaffection. Right, um, you know, this is too far. No, this is too far. And so you've got figures like Dr. Russell Moore, who leave the SBC, Beth Moore, uh, you know, this, uh, evangel uh, uh, this evangelical women's leader, also leave. And, and these stories get a lot of attention, people exiting. Um, 
the survey uh, said yes, some evangelicals are, are leaving, are, they're abandoning ship, 2%. But what happened in the last five years is 6% joined. Um, we're drawn precisely to this politicized evangelicalism, this cultural and political identity. So people who didn't identify as evangelicals back in 2016 now do because this is the, the evangelicalism that's like, oh, if that's what evangelicalism is, I think I'm an evangelical, right? So we're actually seeing evangelicalism, if anything, not becoming weakened, but um, uh, strengthened in, in, in a more reactionary uh, direction. So polarization works for? It does. What I find so interesting is their ability to use an embattled sense, whether they win or lose, yes. right? And so that's an incredible situation to be in for that lover to always be a part of the narrative. Win or lose, you're embattled. It's right? very handy, yeah. it is. Uh, so here, one of the things that I, um, you know, it kind of shaped by what I was hearing around the 2016 election, you know, why did evangelicals vote for Donald Trump? They were just so afraid. Uh, they had reasons to fear, demographic decline, uh, the sea change on LGBTQ issues made them feel uh, increasingly marginalized culturally. And, and then the threats to their religious liberty as they were being you know, inc increasingly marginalized, they had so many reasons to be afraid. And then when I started looking to the history, I realized um, they've been afraid for a long time and uh, genuinely afraid, but the, what, what, what made them afraid changed over time. So communism, right? Some, some valid reasons there. Secular humanism, feminism, right? Democrats, uh, radical Islam, right? You fill in the blank. And then when I looked at, 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 at institutions like Jerry Falwell Sr.'s Thomas Road Baptist Church, I saw the dynamics there, right? Frances Fitzgerald, a journalist on the scene in the early 80s, and she talked about this militancy and, and how fear was stoked in the hearts of the members of that church. And you fear the outsiders and, 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 and how that works. And it, and it enhanced the power of the strong leader of Falwell himself. And so it was very strategic. And then I saw, you know, I looked at the Mark Driscoll situation. I thought that, that is exactly what's going on. And Driscoll, like when he would preach, he flanked himself with bodyguards, right? To give this impression that they are out to get us. They are going to attack us. And so he used this very militaristic rhetoric. They were at war. Well, what happens when you're at war? You can demand absolute loyalty. You must demand absolute loyalty from your followers and absolute sacrifice. So again, the fear was being manufactured by leaders to um, consolidate their own power. Mm -hmm. And it worked fabulously well. And um, in the clearest case where this all came into focus for me in the research for this book was if you've read the book, the chapter on those fake ex-Muslim terrorists Right uh, after 9/11, it was this um, this a, a bunch of um, ex-Muslims went on the evangelical speaking circuit. Some of them still are today, by the way. These same guys, uh, and one of them came to my my university, and my colleague, a historian of the Ottoman Empire who knew a thing or two about Islam, immediately said, "This guy's a fraud." Right, but he was being promoted by Focus on the Family, other guys uh, promoted by CBN, like these, these mainstream evangelical, white evangelical organizations. And you know, he contacted Focus on the Family and it turns out, lo and behold, they knew he was a fraud mm -hmm. and continued to promote these stories of, and what these guys would do is they would tell these completely made up stories how they were these vicious terrorists out to kill American Christians, especially evangelicals, because they're the most faithful, right, to, to stoke Fear And then what I saw in the evangelical communities that I knew, this fear was real. People were desperately afraid of radical Islam and they were coming for their children because that's exactly what the, the literature told them. And that's what these speakers told them. And I realized it was, it was all made up. And that really clicked for me, right? That they, this, the fear was real, but it was being actively manufactured and stoked ultimately in order to consolidate the power of the leaders and raise a lot of money in the process. I remember when DHS put out its um, terrorism alert system that's was color coded. I was talking with a friend and she described it as, she said, ah, orange alert is the new red scare. Yeah. 
And I thought that was uh, really encapsulated it pretty nicely. Not, um, so who are the new enemies? Are they the old enemies? What, how is this new sense of embattlement being constructed, especially in light of Trump's presidency mm -hmm. and uh, January 6th? Yeah, it's been interesting to, to watch this process in real time now, not just you know, looking at documents in the past. One of the most fascinating things for me in the last three years has been to watch the anti-CRT movement bubble up. And, um, and critical again, race theory. critical race theory, yeah. yes. Uh, and, you know, it, it, three years ago, when I first started hearing about this, first in evangelical spaces, I actually, embarrassing confession, I had to Google CRT. <laughs> like, what exactly is this? I know critical theory, I know, you know, uh, so, and, and within, you know, a year, I was getting speaking invitations rescinded because word on the street was, I'm a critical race theorist. Right, this is how this works. And, um, and, and the language around it, so it's Marxist, and it's, uh, it's anti-American, and, and to see the speed with which ordinary people who know even less than I did about CRT, it is now you know, a leading cause for them. And just to see that take shape. Uh, you know, who else is the enemy? Uh, I, I'm keeping a close eye on the stop the steal. You know, that is still going on. And another uh, recent, very recent PRRI poll that came out last week, I think, 60% of white evangelicals uh, believe that Trump won the election. 39% of those believe that violence may be necessary to save the country. So, democracy. Democracy. Uh, yes, D democracy here. So another another shift that's happening is with the demographic demographic decline. Uh, the the um, uh, you know, majority is no longer on the side of white Christians, and so democracy is no longer uh, necessarily strategic. And and this is certainly something not not to be too alarmist, but these are the trends that I'm watching very closely. And to be honest, the, the survey data that comes out now with regularity uh, is, is, does give cause for concern. Can, I was also struck in the book that you, you treat this all with, uh, you're making an argument about what is, what is happening and also that, that it's not right, <laughs> you know, that it's implicit, sometimes explicit, but it, you're not snide towards the actors mm -hmm. or the people who were caught, you know, who are involved in this. So how has the book been received by the people that you're writing about. Yeah, uh, you know, when I wrote this book, I felt, it felt urgent. I really wanted to, I, I, again, I've been tracking this for a long time, kind of seeing it culminate in 2016, and everything that was happening 2016, and with, the, with uh, Trump taking office and his first act in office, all of this, I felt, I felt like it was playing out according to a script, and I knew it, I knew the script. So I felt this great urgency to write it. So I wrote this book not even thinking much about its reception, except I did think that probably, I, I just wanted to get the story right, and I wanted to tell it as powerfully as possible and then put it out in the world, and that's kind of as far as I thought. Um, when I thought a little further, I, I mostly thought that white evangelicals are gonna hate me. Uh, and and you know, I was told by my publisher's lawyer to brace myself for vicious trolling when this book came out. I don't know how one does that, but I was you know, bracing myself. Hey, um, put caps lock on? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, 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 I took a uh, couple of uh, measures uh, to kind of batten down the hatches. And then the book came out, June of 2020. And uh, within a couple of days, I started getting letters. And uh, it was not hate mail. People imagine that I get a lot of hate mail. I get almost none. Um, now, like, don't, don't, like, <laughs> sorry. That's, not, that's not a challenge? No, not a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I still, I receive hundreds, I, well over a thousand. I don't even know, every, every day, still, two to three letters, at least, from evangelical readers uh, saying thank you for this book. Um, saying, almost all of them say, say some version of, this is the story of my life. And then they, many of them will go into great detail and, and talk about, I was at that 1996 Promise Keeper right, event. I was at, you know, I, I've been in the room with all these people. Some people will, will give me pictures of their bookshelves with like all the books that I'm writing about, right? And so this is intimately familiar to many evangelical readers or former evangelicals. And then they say, but I never understood how all these pieces fit together. 
And so it's been an interesting, um, it, it's, it's white evangelicals uh, or, and former evangelicals who have made this book a bestseller, and I have been really moved by the humility with which so many are receiving this book, um, and particularly conservative white evangelical men who see this book not as a book tearing down the Christian faith, but as a book that helps them to peel back some of the cultural layers that may have distorted the biblical faith that they claim to profess, and that they see this as, um, as actually um, a, a project that helps them reform their own, their own understanding. Uh, and so it really is, you know, I, there are many conservative white evangelical men who identify as complementarians uh, who are our proselytizers for this this book and I, I did not expect that and it's been incredibly gratifying I'm, I'm really interested in the in the way in which evangelicals might be thinking about excavating a different story that leads to different conclusions as they're peeling back the layers of the kind of cultural pro project that they're engaged in so have you talked to people who are doing that work? And what stories are they excavating about an alternative vision mm -hmm. for what evangelicalism has been and can be in the future? Right now, there's a lot of questions, right? There's a lot of people saying, where, where do we go? Uh, they're individually, people feeling alienated from their faith communities, from their organizations. Um, and so one of the first pieces of advice that I give, and I'm very uncomfortable giving advice, I'm much more comfortable telling what happened <laughs> as a historian, and now I'm in this weird position where, where I, I feel like I've got to say something, but I'm, I'm just making it up as I go along. Um, but I, I, I think I can draw some lessons from the, the, the past. Uh, so one thing that I tell white evangelicals is, um, you, it, it, you don't have to come up with these stories yourselves. Um, think about who you have excluded from your conversations, from your faith communities. Which voices have you excluded? Because much of, uh, you know, I talk about this being networks and alliances. I'm very fascinated with um, where and how boundaries are drawn and the boundaries of orthodoxy. In, in many of the communities that I'm looking at here, they're drawn around complementarianism, around patriarchy. Like that is gospel orthodoxy, gospel truth. You cross the line on gender, LGBTQ, you, you're, you're on the outs. But on this direction, you can be blatantly racist and you know we're maybe taking things a little too far but brother in christ um, or misogynistic abusive even right and so so i urge evangelicals to think about who has been excluded from their conversations and um and here we have to talk about race as well and um and to remind white evangelicals that the church this is a, a phrase that evangelicals use a lot the church by which i m often they mean you know, the white evangelical church, uh, because white evangelicals have long seen themselves as the most faithful remnant of the church in the world today. America as a Christian nation and American evangelicals and conservative evangelicals have this special role to play. And so part of what I do is kind of remind them, nah, <laughs> it's not on you, you know, you can relax. Um, and, and you don't have to be scrambling right now to fix white evangelicalism. I mean, by all means, do. Uh, but in terms of the fate of Christianity, if that is your concern, Christianity is actually thriving in other spaces. So, so maybe go there. Uh, maybe cross some of those boundaries that you've built up and, um, and listen and learn. And maybe you come back and you build something new, or maybe you stay and you keep listening and learning. And so, um, so th that's one answer that I give. Um, and then al also, ultimately, this, this book is about power. And so when we're talking about what other stories, uh, you know, to go back to the Gospels, to go back to the, the Jesus in the Gospels, and to look at what is so radically countercultural about this Messiah, uh, who was nothing like the, uh, the earthly king that his followers expected him to be, and you know, to me, as a Christian, that's what's so amazing, and that's what's so incredibly hard to live up to if you claim to follow that Christ. And what I've seen in, in American evangelicalism is too often they go for the warrior Christ. Like they literally transform the Jesus of the Gospels into 
a rugged man with tattoos down his leg, riding a, a, a horse, wielding a bloody sword, right? This is their Jesus. And uh, so you can also just go back to the scriptures and get rid of this warrior Christ. I mean, you've got Revelation. We can talk about interpretations of Revelation, but that's all I've got. Uh, and, and go to the Jesus of the Gospels and then and, and, and look there for some stories. We're going to move to questions in just a second. So start to think of the questions that you have. Before we do, you, your first book was an Oxford University Press book. This is a, a trade book, a popular book. What's the craft of doing history for in those different ways? Something that is about advancing the public understanding as opposed to academic understanding. How do you do your work differently as a historian? Yeah, I you know I, I kind of made the switch. It was Oxford's fault actually because when I wrote my first book uh, back in 2015, uh, they asked me to uh, to blog on the Oxford University Press blog. And so I did, and what I realized very quickly was that more people read that one blog post than would ever read my actual book. And I grieved for a moment, but rather than just staying in that place, I thought, okay, okay, I can do this, right? And I thought my first book was on a history of Christian feminism. And I thought, you know, yes, it's an academic book, and it's not a super accessible um, I mean, it, it's, I thought, you know, we all say that we write as scholars, but we're still, you know, accessible to the general reader. But there's a lot of historiography packed in, especially a first book uh, that comes from a dissertation. And um, so what I, I started to do is just, I thought Christian women in particular could really, it changed my life, my historical research. Yeah, I grew up in a very conservative uh, space and, and what I encountered, the stories I encountered of, of Christian women changed my understanding of, of, of Christianity and gender. And so I wanted to make that accessible and so I started um, writing more blog posts. And then I started taking those and putting them on Facebook because that's where a lot of white evangelical women were. Now they're moving to Instagram, but still Facebook. And um, so I just started uh, sharing my research. And then I started sharing other people's research because I love being an academic. I love what I do. And I think my colleagues are doing incredibly interesting work. And I, I just put that into kind of bite-sized pieces. And sure enough, you know, people I'd gone to undergrad with, people that, you know, fellow moms of kids at school ended up agreeing this is fascinating stuff and it's a window into a world that they otherwise don't have much access to and one thing led to another and a kind of community formed around it and um, I continued to blog and blogging did a couple of things for me it taught me how to write very quickly uh, because you just have to write all the time and it it I I knew that when you encounter something online the reader is going to be tempted to click away every single paragraph, if not every single sentence. You have to fight for their attention. And I did that by blogging, just instinct, and I, I kind of honed that craft, had a lot of fun with it. And then when it came time to write this book, I thought it needs to be, this needs to be with a trade press. Um, so there's, it's, it's academic in the research that went into it, but I used that blogging style, had a little fun with it, uh, and really tried to fight for my reader's attention every single paragraph and keep them with me. And plus I'm a professor, I assign fabulous academic books that are beautifully written, compellingly right, researched, and I assign them to my students and my students find them boring. <laughs> and so again, I knew what I was up against and I really tried to, um, to package this story in a way that would be compelling to readers. Great. Well, let's move to questions. Um, we have a mic, and so if you could introduce yourself. Can I get a runner for this? Um, where, there you go. And so if you quickly introduce yourself and state your question as quickly as possible. Uh, we've got one here in the yellow mask. Hi. Is this? It, it's for the oh, people, it's for the audience okay. at home. Um. Hi, my name is uh, Sophie and I'm a first year uh, MDiv here at the Divinity School. Um, my question has to do with kind of the ex-evangelical movement, which is something I've followed just sort of on social media. Um, and I find that when people are talking about leaving the evangelical church, it's almost always women for one thing. And the reasons that they're leaving is kind of the sexism and the misogyny and all of that, or people of color, and the reason is the racism. So I'm curious um, with people that you've talked to, when you see these men that are, that are taken in by this who have left, 
What are their reasons? Why do they leave when they do go? Yeah, I, um, I hear from probably as many men as women in terms of the exvangelical movement. And, and even calling it an exvangelical movement is maybe imposing too much order on this uh, than, than really there is because I, I get a lot of messages and I have a lot of interactions you know, on Twitter and so on. It's a, it's a space for the exvangelical, you know, we have the hashtag and so on. Uh, and I, I see a lot of diversity within that movement. What, um, what exvangelical means to them, you know, deconstruction is a word that's used in many different ways in that space. And so uh, I'm not one who tries to impose, uh, you know, here's how, what that word means. I just listen and, and observe very carefully what the variety of meanings that people um, are, 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 are um, applying to that word. But um, for men, a few different things. I, I, hear, I hear it from many men who were all in for a time, uh, but some never felt they measured up to this ideal of masculinity. And yet they were being told over and over again, you know, from the pulpits, certainly from their, their men's groups, from the, the books they were reading, you know, which, which are read in this context of small groups, you know, like God's word to you. This isn't just like, oh, reading a book, take it or leave it. The context is really critical. And if you know, you know, what small groups are, you know what small groups are. My editor didn't. He's like, what's a small group, <laughs> right? You know, <laughs> like, oh, let me explain. Um, then, um, and, and, you know, I heard from men, um, I, I, I quote one of them in the conclusion, a, a man with a disability who couldn't do the rock climbing on the weekends with the guys from church. He's like, what's, you know, am I not a real man? Am I not a real Christian man? Um, many men who were like, I would have preferred to go to an art museum on the weekend with some guys from church, not an option, right? And so you start wondering, like, is the problem me? Is it Christianity? Uh, if, if, it's, if it's kind of, if you're forced to fit in a box, even though we can talk about power and, you know, uh, patriarchal power here, for many men, this was also very oppressive. And so there's that for, for others, uh, for many women in particular, but women and men it is coming face to face with the stories of abuse. You know, after being told for so long that, you know, uh, family values, sexual purity, and then to just see what has gone on in the same evangelical spaces that have been promoting those teachings, enforcing those rules on young women, and it, the hypocrisy is just too much. That has been a breaking point for many. Um, for others, over the last five years, it really is the, you know, everything that goes with the, the, the Trump presidency. Here too, I think for a long time, uh, words, were being used, uh, language was being used that covered up some pretty deep differences that were there within evangelical spaces. So, you know, um, sure we love our neighbors and we are family values, uh, Christians, and you know, this kind of self-perception. And for many evangelicals, uh, the the seeming hypocrisies of the support for Trump and of Trump's policies, whether it was on immigration, border control, uh, the George Floyd moment was key for some. Uh, you know, there was a series of events and the kind of cumulative effect for many and the abuse, the Me Too mo moment, was just too much. And, and they could see the hypocrisy underneath. Um, so, a variety of different reasons, I think, and um, it's, an, it's an interesting moment right now because a lot of social media is a space where they're finding community, whereas many feel isolated in their local communities, in their churches, in their organizations, and they don't know that there is a, a community perhaps locally. Sometimes what I do is, uh, you know, on social media, I connect people like, hey, you're out in Boulder, so is this person. You guys should have coffee sometime, right? To have the real community, because I think a lot of ex-evangelicals or people on the edges are feeling really isolated right now and alienated. My name is Clark Gilpin. I'm a retired professor. Uh, my curiosity comes from the angle of John Wayne. Uh, when I flip 
through the channels on my TV, I regularly run across one in which uh, it's coming out of South Bend, Indiana, that shows nothing but old westerns. And almost invariably, that western begins with a lone horseman riding across a barren prairie into a small and dusty town that is under threat. So my question, my curiosity is, how in popular evangelical culture do they think about individualism and the relationship between the individual and the community? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And that's, that's the appeal of the cowboy hero, right? It resonates with this individualism, the hero out in the Wild West. Of course, this mythical ideal, right? But this is, this is the ideal that is celebrated in the, uh, you know, particularly the post-war, you know, early Cold War Westerns, and that's the heyday. Uh, and so there's a lot of scholarship out there on, uh, you know, this, this American individualism. And, and also, not coincidentally, and we can bring race into this equation, even though actually in the Wild West there were, you know, African-American cowboys, there was a lot of racial diversity, you know, uh, Hispanic. Uh, cowboys, but you know the the film hero is a white man, Lone Ranger kind of guy with a gun who can bring order through violence uh, or through the threat of violence. Right? You always know that he has the gun and can use it if needed. And what I saw in you know kind of looking at John Wayne's greatest hits too, and um, you know I, I'm not a film critic. I was more interested in how the John Wayne that was kind of held up as icon. Um, but when you look at his greatest hits, the movies he's most known for, he's, he's the white guy with a gun who brings order through violence um, by subduing non-white populations. And I, I think that is worth noting, right? So Mexicans in the Alamo, the Vietnamese in the Green Berets, the Native Americans, right? the Japanese in the Sands of Iwo Jima. And um, that is who he was on screen as this, this hero. And, and by the 1970s in particular, a, a kind of retrograde hero, because uh, for progressives, for anti-war activists, you know, this, this cowboy ideal was getting a little dated, uh, but for conservatives, right, that, uh, that's when he became, and this, this ideal became that much more significant. It was a kind of oppositional identity that they embraced because it seemed like the rest of American culture was rejecting it, and that was leaving America um, emasculated and unable to defend themselves uh, on, in terms of foreign policy, like explicit connections made there, what went wrong in Vietnam, uh, liberals sabotaging us. What's interesting is, is hearing some of this rhetoric even today. Uh, you know, I, I've been tracking Josh Hawley, and Madison Cawthorn and, and how they are talking about the threat of the left, the left as emasculating American men, making them unable to stand up to, to what? Uh, right, they're too compliant, they're too tolerant. They need to stand up to defend this country against whom, it, this is in the, we have to see it in the context of stop the steal. Uh, the election, January 6th, right? This is the political context that they are now calling for conservative men to stand up and defend the nation. Hi, my name is Ross Allen. Uh, I'm a third year MDiv. Um, and, and my question is kind of um, to the point you're making about the presence of evangelicals in um, mainline Protestant spaces and Catholic spaces, I, I'm assuming as well. Um, largely because I think a lot of the constructive theological work that's been done, at least in places like U Chicago and to some extent in biblical studies as well, has been done on behalf of mainline Protestant institutions that tend to think of themselves as pretty progressive, or at least from the top are articulated that way. Um, and then when it push comes to shove in some of these uh, um, political iterations of evangelicalism, you're going to find those people in these churches that, that from the top wouldn't necessarily reflect the values that those people then go and act out on. So part of my question is, do you have a sense of where um, people m offering leadership in these mainline Protestant spaces or folks doing constructive work, either in biblical studies or theology or wherever, it might be in, in dialogue and actually um, 
doing God talk that changes how people are, are um, living in the world, or, or is it the kind of thing where you think there's just political forces at work and some of it's going to have to play out? So you know, there, there is vibrant work absolutely being done in the in in mainline spaces, theological work. Um, and you know many individuals, and not just the white mainline, but we can you know should should broaden our scope and think about uh, the the black prophetic tradition in particular as well, and as a source of much of the good work that's being done in the the Protestant mainline and and in some predominantly white spaces as well. Um, but then there's a distribution problem, and where evangelicals have excelled is in this mass market. And they have excelled in part because they really invested in this infrastructure, right? They really have. And it's an investment that's paid off in all sorts of ways, including financially. But it also works better for conservative evangelicals who have more of this bunker mentality, right? Who have perpetuated this idea that the threat is right out there. It, it's, the threat is actually the church right down the, the road. Um, you cannot trust that you're going to get correct doctrine there, and your very soul is at stake and that of your children. And so you need to protect from outside influences and also don't trust the mainstream media. This goes way back, right? Don't trust the news networks. Uh, we need our own sources of news and information. We need our own music, uh, right? We, need, we don't want the, those corrupt impulses um, in our homes, in our families. And so there is a lot more incentive to, uh, within conservative spaces, there, there's just a much stronger market there. Whereas for many progressives, they are much more, um, you know, open and affirming to impulses that are coming from the from outside of their faith tradition. They're curious, they're welcoming, they're hospitable, and they, you know, are fine with their kids encountering different traditions. And um, and so, you know, that may be all well and good, but what that means is you don't have the strong market there. It's not going to be as profitable to produce for that market, whereas within conservative evangelicalism, there are gatekeepers. There are gatekeepers at publishing houses, Christian radio stations, uh, Christian music, right? Um, you, they know that there are lines you do not cross because you will miss this market. The gatekeepers will shut you down. Your books will not be for sale um, at the end booth at Hobby Lobby. My book is not for sale there. Uh, <laughs> Right, and, and there are rules that have to be followed, and so that can that um, the the market will then dictate. So what happens is in many mainline churches, where's your Sunday school curriculum coming from? Often evangelical sources, uh, because they're producing so much more um, for mainline churches who have book clubs and want to to look at a religious book together. Uh, there's a good chance it's going to come uh, in many churches from an evangelical publishing house. Right, and so, so there are market factors here that are at play, and I don't have any great solutions to that uh, because it's almost an apples and oranges kind of thing, but we should at least be aware of that. And maybe um, progressives need to, to be more intentional consumers. Hi, um, my name is Ding. I'm a second year MA student in the Divinity School. Um, thank you for this amazing talk. And uh, just a quick comment before my question. I was amazed to discover that when you bring this uh, reflection and mindfulness to your readers group, the evangelical uh, men, you get more appreciation than anger. That's really inspiring. <laughs> And my question is mostly out of curiosity. It's like a child question. Um, when you talk about how the politics are fabricating fear to get power and profit, that just reminds me of the cartoon movie of Monsters, Inc. I don't know if anyone's seen it. And, but they, they get a business uh, scope transition to the fabrication of uh, happiness and joy. And I wonder if you think there's a remote possibility that the politics ever uh, transition to that range of making profit and <laughs> power? And if so, uh, what would be the conditions to realize that possibility and what us scholars could do to do uh, in this? Yeah, I love that question. Mm -hmm. 
And I don't have a good answer, but I love the possibility, right, that it's holding out because for me, having spent so much time doing this research and in these spaces, it does start to feel almost inevitable, like this is what you do, this is how it works, this is, um, this is how you build a movement, this is how you get people to dig deep in their pockets and contribute to your cause. Fear is an, is an enormously powerful motivator. How do you counter that? You know, I think there are spiritual resources that we can look to. Um, contemplative resources, scriptural resources, you know, do not fear appears an awful lot in the Christian scriptures too. And so it always kind of puzzles me that um, the, this fear has been so powerful. Um, and there are reasons for that, right? It, when, when you bring it uh, together with Christian nationalism, this idea that Christianity must be protected and defended and that this is what God has called you to do instead of maybe to be a suffering servant and instead of um, to just leave it to God and, and be faithful in a small way. Um, but but I, I do like to imagine the, you know, what can joy do here? Um, how could joy mobilize people? Um, I, I would just leave that as a, as a challenge, I think, for all of us, and it's something I will take with me, um, particularly as I am now in, in spaces where we are teaming up together across disciplines, across traditions, uh, to say, where do we go from here? It's, it's one thing to identify the problem. It's really hard to figure out we need psychologists around the table, we need spiritual guides around the table, we need, you know, uh, political strategists, I don't know, like anybody can come to the table to figure out, okay, if this is where we are, where, where do we go from here and how do we lead out of this moment? And I do not have a great answer. In the, scar in the uh, burgundy scarf here, a question. Thank you. Hi, I'm Caroline. Um, I'm a first year MA student. And when I was first learning about this, um, I was really struck by sort of in the beginning of the formation of what we would now consider the, like the evangelical right, that there is like almost a vehement denial of like political involvement or political investment. And I think we don't see that as much now, but I was wondering how you make sense of that. You know, actually we do. If you're listening in, in certain spaces, I will still come up against this a lot, a denial among conservative white evangelicals that they are politically motivated. Uh, I mean, I will, um, you know, hear people absolutely swear that their church is not in the least political. And I will go to that church and I will hear their pastor pray during the long prayer, if, if you know, you know, all right, uh, <laughs> against the evils of big government. <laughs> it's like, right, but that doesn't even feel political. That is just good versus evil. That's just, right, who we are. It is so deeply entrenched. And yeah, I will, I will even some evangelical scholars will really insist that um, I've had some of these, these kind of battles, um, you know, no, the heart of evangelicalism is not politics. It is, you know, evangelicals are tithing. They are generous people. They are salt of the earth individuals. They are um, 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 deeply concerned about just raising their children. This is what it is to be an evangelical. And they just want to spread the love of Jesus. And they are giving to missions, right? All of that is true. But that is not the whole story. And so as a cultural historian, just as a, as a religious historian, I want to say, okay, what are they evangelizing? What is the gospel that they are? Because it's not some pure theological construct. It is this whole package. Um, they want to raise their children. Um, what does that look like? What does that mean about other people's children, right? There, there is no pure, isolated um, evangelicalism that is not cultural and political. And that is absolutely a, a conversation that we are, um, that is still happening uh, across these evangelical spaces, I think. Um, but there is a long history to that, right? So uh, James Dobson is one of the central figures in this book. And I insist that he ought to be one of the central figures in our history of American evangelicalism. But again, if you go back to uh, many histories that have been written on evangelicalism, he might get a paragraph if that. 
uh, because he's not a theologian. He's, he's not at a leading seminary, right? He's kind of over here. But, um, and he insisted early on too, not political. No, not political. I'm just helping you raise your kids, right? From the beginning, he was deeply political. He became explicitly so in a partisan way at a certain moment, but by that time, he had already cultivated this vast and loyal audience in ways that, yes, were political. Like, like, like I, I describe in the book, dare, uh, dare to discipline, right? You know, I always heard this, this is child rearing. This is when I went back and, and read the book, I was, I was probably raised on it, um, but when I went and actually read it, I was like, it was so deeply political. It was reacting to the disorder of the 1960s uh, and teaching parents how to make sure that their children wouldn't become the anti-war pro protesters, the hippies out in the streets. That is a political message. And, and so, yes, that denial has been there a long time. I still see it in many evangelical circles. Uh, hi, I'm Russell Johnson. I teach here. Um, my question, so I, I'm reminded of the, after Wild at Heart came out, John Eldred and his wife Stacy wrote the book Captivating, which was billed as like this sort of companion volume sequel for <laughs> women. Uh, and, and so my question is, do you see the, um, the biblical womanhood movement and all the literature that comes out of that as, as part of the exact same movement as this muscular Christianity? Or is it a separate thing? Are they two sides of the same coin? If you could just talk about the dynamics there, that'd be fascinating. Yes, uh, biblical womanhood, two sides of the same coin, absolutely. Uh, so, you know, the idea of what it is to be a Christian woman uh, and the, uh, the Eldridges are, are this great model because you have, you know, a, a, a man has an adventure to live, a battle to fight, and a beauty to rescue, and it's the woman's role to share in the adventure of a man, to be the beauty who is, is rescued, uh, and to, uh, to, to be the beauty that inspires the hero, uh, which is, uh, so, and that's, that's just one, one book, but this whole genre of biblical womanhood, it's beauty, it's femininity, it's, and this beauty is important because, uh, because men are perceived to have an aggressive sex drive, and uh, so that uh, kind of social order and purity has to be preserved through heterosexual marriage, and so it really is the wife's role to uh, fulfill her husband's sexual needs, and so she has to constantly seduce him. She has to keep up her appearances. She, she's obligated to do so. It's her duty, and that's her one of her functions, really, um, to, to shore up the social order and protect morality. Um, and so this, and then all that goes along uh, on top of that, biblical womanhood. Uh, we're talking about theologically being submissive to patriarchal authority. Uh, often it takes the form of uh, upholding domesticity as the ultimate female ideal. Um, so in, in many conservative Christian circles, it's frowned upon to have a woman working outside the home, certainly to have a woman have a career. Uh, and there's a lot of emphasis placed on uh, the domestic crafts, on being a mom, and, um, and that is really a woman's uh, glory. Uh, so that goes hand in hand then with this more rugged masculinity, protector and provider, and, and that's how this works. So one of the things that I've, I've noted, and I went to a Karen Pence rally, um, well, I mean, it was a Trump rally, but Karen Pence was the speaker. It was just fascinating because you could just see how the Trump model, the you know, kind of rugged warrior masculinity, protect Christianity, um, and, and he was so perfect for it because he was so utterly uh, unrestrained by traditional virtue. Uh, so he's perfect. Uh, how that went hand in hand with this femininity. Uh, so one of my favorite things to do is to go through like Hobby Lobby, uh, Chip and Joanna Gaines, right, the Magnolia. Uh, and I went to this rally in Holland, Michigan, and it was like it was decorated by Joanna Gaines. Uh, and it was Karen Pence speaking, and she was masterful. 
and she and it was Christian praise music being played and it was just so intimately feel, familiar I knew that world like that that is my next book live laugh love is looking at the femininity side of this cultural production and seeing how it too is reinforcing political economic and racial values so they absolutely go hand in hand I mean literally so in heterosexual marriage yeah well at time. So I want to thank you on behalf of the Divinity School, the Marty Center, the University for joining us once thank again. You. If you haven't yet picked up her book, there's a QR code where you can order it from the uh, Seminary Co-op Bookstore. Um, so give me, uh, join me in uh, a round of applause. Thank you. For thank you. Time. There's some drinks in the hallway. Linger, ask questions, and thanks for spending your evening with us.